Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 48. Today, I'm very pleased to be sharing with you an interview with someone who has been a big influence throughout my Nature Journal journey. I'm talking with fellow Australian and Nature Journal educator Paula Peters. Paula has a blog all about nature journaling and she writes under the name Paperbark Writer. If you're a fan of the Beatles, you'll understand this reference. Paula's website is overflowing with information, free downloads, instructional videos and articles all about nature journaling, particularly with an Australian focus. I love this because there are so many resources about nature journaling and nature connection, but the majority of these resources have a strong leaning towards nature and seasons in the Northern Hemisphere. Down here in Australia, we can sometimes feel like we're missing out on the action but Paula's work goes a long way to helping with this. Paula has a background in science and a love of art, and in her current work as a nature journal educator, she's bringing people closer to nature, using all the tools in her tool belt. Through this interview, you'll hear that Paula has a deep connection with the land she calls home. Let's listen. Paula, thank you so much for being here with me. Well, thanks for having me, Bethan. How exciting. Yeah, this is fun. So I usually start by asking about people's early nature experiences, and I wonder if nature's been part of your life right from the start. Oh, absolutely. So I just I just um, was a nature crazy kid from the start, but let me qualify that. It was crazy about animals at the start. So my whole world was full of animals and I didn't like dolls. I never played with dolls. I always had lots of stuffed toys and plastic farm animals and things like that. So, so that liking for animals came from as early as I can remember. And then I was fortunate enough to grow up in Victoria in Australia, where we had a third of an acre block which was where our house was with a big backyard and um, yeah so I spent as a kid I used to just like spending a lot of time in the backyard underneath um, a big oak tree that we had in the backyard actually so yeah but our, but our family was also very interested in going camping even though my parents were migrants they came from the Netherlands in the 50s um, they were really interested in exploring Australia so a lot of our weekends we spent going away, visiting national parks, camping, that sort of thing. So I feel very blessed that I had that exposure to nature really young. Yeah. Yes. Oh, wow. And so you grew up and when you had a career, it was in a, a career in ecology. And do you think your younger sort of foundations led you to choosing that? Oh, yeah. So it was always going to be something about animals. And, and when I was a kid, I didn't know what that was. And in Victoria, when I was growing up, um, we had this thing called the Careers Guide. So when I was in Year 7, we had a session where we had to look through the Careers Guide and pick something that we might want to do. And I was sort of looking <laughs> through it and feeling very lost until I came right to the end. And under Z, there was zoologist. And I said, well, that's exactly what I want to do because that's somebody who oh. spends their whole life studying animals and looking at animals and all that sort of stuff. So... So from the age of 12, I wanted to be a zoologist. And along the way, I discovered that plants are very cool as well. And so when I reached, uh, when I got to uni, I did zoology and botany and ecology. And um, it's interesting that I ended up doing science. I was always interested in science, but um, in when I was growing up in my family, art wasn't seen to be an option. Art was sort of a Mickey Mouse, airy-fairy thing that, the real people didn't do because if you did art you wouldn't get a job <laughs> so so I was sort of actively encouraged to not do art um, and I don't really regret that because obviously I've come back to it um, and I discovered the world of science which is amazing as well. So art was a passion for you back then as as well in your youth? Oh yeah I was drawing all the time yeah that's another yeah. thing I started doing very young drawing I was heavily into reading so I was um 
Yeah, no, I, I don't remember writing so much as a kid, but I certainly remember spending a lot of time with my nose in books and imagining myself in the stories and that sort of thing. So the whole um, drawing, writing thing was there. Um, mm. But, but yeah, the curiosity and the analytical side was always there too because, um, yeah, that's, that's a, also another really interesting facet of when you're in nature thinking about it and asking questions. Yeah, and so were your first nature journals field journals, scientific field journals? Is that where it started? That's a really good question, isn't it? Um, I certainly started sketching things as a kid. Like I remember going to the zoo and sketching animals, um, which was just more about uh, yeah, and trying to draw birds. And I was always trying to draw stuff, whether it was not – it was sometimes from real life, but often – um, copying pictures from books um, but yeah I think you write the, the first field journals it would be a scenario like I'd go camping and I wouldn't um, know what things were and I would try and write down a bird list and sometimes um, jot down features of a bird that I didn't know or and, and often with plants I, I discovered pretty early that and when I say early I discovered in my early 20s I suppose when I was doing my study and started working in jobs, um, I started to realise that if you draw, if you're out in the field and you draw a plant, you're much more likely to remember it. And I, and I suppose the other foundation of this is when I was at uni doing zoology and botany, it was still the time when we did huge long pracs. We did six hour pracs where we did a lot of drawing and that was part of the technique. So if you are doing a, a prac in invertebrate zoology, you end up drawing all these weird and wonderful specimens because that's how you... <laughs> you're really forced to look. So, so that whole concept of draw something, you'll be forced to look, um, yeah, that was ingrained, I think, by my science degree. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Mm. So you had a career in ecology, zoology, botany, and then you transitioned into the career you're pursuing now, which is teaching and opening the world to nature journaling. And I'm wondering about that transition. How did that happen? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, I, I did, um, after my science degree, the whole reason I did my science degree and my PhD was to get into the world of wildlife conservation. So even though I was really interested and I could have um, pursued a more academic research career, um, I always had a really strong desire to work actively in conservation. So, so yeah, so that led to... Um, uh, a few different uh, roles, mostly with state government environmental agencies in South Australia and here in Queensland. And um, that was a really interesting time and went to a lot of places and worked with some great people and, and different um, species and ecosystems. But I ended up in working in Brisbane in head office uh, and part of that reason was that I'd moved up to Queensland to look after my mum, who was getting um, older, and I wanted to spend more time with her and help her out. And so the compromise was moving from regional South Australia to uh, the city. And um, anyway, to cut a long story short, um, mum passed away, and so I was still working in this um, city job, and I found it very disconnected to the things that had drawn me to work in that sort of job in the first yes. place. So the things that I really enjoyed about my wildlife conservation work was actually being in the field <laughs> and seeing um, plants and animals and ecosystems, but also working with people who were sort of at the coal face. It's sort of a silly thing to say in Queensland since coal is such a threat to our environment. But no, <laughs> people who were on the ground doing conservation work, I always enjoyed working with, with people like that and instead... I was in a, a big city office in Brisbane with a bunch of bureaucrats writing policy and it really wasn't, um, didn't tick many boxes in terms of things that I really enjoyed. And um, yeah, so I needed a bit of a circuit breaker and at the time I had a very understanding boss and I asked him for a year without, a year of leave without pay. And the whole idea of that was I was just going to spend that writing a book that I had in my head for years about um, different vegetation types in Queensland and I've never written that book but what happened in that year where I had that year off without pain I lived on my savings was um, 
I discovered lots of things, um, including that I was an artist. It had taken me until that time to figure that out, and I was about <laughs> 45. Um, yeah, and during that, that year, I, 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 I created my website and started to do a few things and, and started to think, hey, I might be able to make a living out of this. And, and a big um, part of that was going up to Bimblebox Nature Refuge in central Queensland. And for those of you that aren't aware, um, in Queensland we have a system where uh, private landholders can create a nature refuge, which provides a little bit of protection towards an area of land. And the people who bought, to, bought uh, the Bimblebox Nature Refuge initially bought it to protect it from uh, vegetation clearing, which was ra rampant at that time in that part of Queensland. So it's this wonderful uh, huge patch of uh, native woodland in sort of smack bang in sort of dead centre of Queensland almost. And um, the other tradition at that, at that um, nature refuge is an art science nature camp. So the people who, who own Bimblebox are very keen to invite other people to come there and to experience what that woodland is like, but also artists and scientists, scientists to research it, artists to produce artwork, that sort of thing. So I went along to Bimblebox in 2015, which is that year where I took off, and um, and it was the first time I'd spent time with a bunch of artists, and it was great because it was I suddenly realised that the way I'd been looking at stuff was very similar to the way artists look at stuff. And, yes. and sort of up until that time, a lot of my friends and colleagues uh, were from a science background. And a lot of those people are still very dear to me, but um, sometimes the approach of approaching nature is quite different if you're coming from a science or a much more pragmatic background. Whereas with these artists, they were, I'd sort of pick up a, a branch of something to try and identify it and, and they'd be going, oh, can I take a bit of that because I really like the shape or I really like the colour or yes. can you tell me what that is? So, <laughs> so, yeah, I was helping them in terms of identifying stuff. But I was sort of interested in, the, in all the aesthetics too, so that was very cool. So, and at the end of um, the, the other thing about Bimblebox Nature Refuge is that even though it has got some protection um, from various threats, it's not protected from mining. So um, Bimblebox is currently under threat from uh, uh, mining plans uh, to mine coal by um, Clive Palmer's Waratah Coal Company. So, and that threat is ongoing. Um, so I thought one thing I could do to try and raise awareness of Bimblebox is to create a colouring book. And the reason I decided on the colouring book at that time was I don't know if you remember, but 2015 was the year of the crazy adult colouring book craze where yes, I do know, remember. <laughs> everyone was getting into colouring. You remember that? Yeah, I'm sure a lot of us do. It was quite remarkable. And interestingly, <laughs> at the time, the type of drawing and the type of art I was most comfortable with was just using line, like ink line, to do outlines and a little bit of shading to draw in that way. And um, so for me, I was very uncomfortable with using colour or anything like that because I'd never done much of it. So for me at the time, I thought, but I could do this. I could do a colouring book because I can do that style. And anyway, so I ended up um, creating this colouring book in September of that year and printing it and publishing it myself and sold quite a lot. And I thought, oh, this is good. Maybe I can survive on this sort of thing and not have to go back to my office job. But the yes. clincher came when... Um, a fellow from um, New South Wales Department of Environment saw the Bimblebox Wonderland colouring book on Twitter and he got in touch with me and said, I'd really like you to do a colouring book for me and I'll pay you. And so that that became the Riverina Grassland Ramblings colouring book. And once that happened, I thought, oh, yeah, maybe I can make a living from this. Yes. So, so, yeah, that was how the transition started. And it's taken me quite a few years to actually... Uh, really convince myself that I can make a living from it. It's not, it wasn't a, 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 a steady upward trajectory. There were sort of hiccups along the way and a bit of a roller coaster ride in terms of finances. Um, but but um, I think in the last six months or so, I'm finally feeling comfortable that I think it's working. <laughs> so that was a very long winded answer to your question, Bethan. No, that's wonderful. What a beautiful start. And you're doing such amazing work and you've since published a whole bunch of books. 
And one of them is a little book called Make a Date with Nature, an introduction to nature journaling. And in this little book, you describe the what, why and how of nature journaling and how to start and how to keep going. It's such a informative book, really good for introducing people to nature journaling. And I wonder if you were to describe to someone, if you met someone on the street and you were going to try to tell them about nature journaling if they'd never known about it, how would you describe it? How would you describe what it is and why they should start doing it? Yeah, look, there's so many different takes on this. Um, My personal take on it is nature journaling is drawing and writing in response to nature and I explain to people how I take a bunch of people outside into nature and um, just encouraging them that they can draw and they can write and in the process of that um, they often observe more, they feel a bit more connected um, and nature journaling has so many different benefits in in terms of um, oh, just, just that whole being in nature thing is one of them um, and there's more and more studies that show how good that is for our physical health, our mental health. Um, but um, the good thing about, well, I mean, I don't have to tell you, you know all about this and I'm sure our listeners do too, is that when you draw something, often you see more, but often it, once you start observing more, it becomes quite an intense experience. I find if I sort of really start um looking and observing, all my senses tend to be heightened and and not only do I see more but in the process of doing that drawing I'll be hearing more and I'll be remembering those memories sort of get more etched in your mind so I might have a much clearer memory of what what else was happening around me when I was drawing than if I didn't do the drawing which is like another interesting side effect. Yes. You also have a new book called Take This Book for a Walk, a step-by-step guide to nature journaling. And this book I just love so much. I recommend it to everybody. (laughs) It's a book where you can write directly into the pages and you have prompts and it's full of ideas and scaffolding. I just love it. And I just want to say congratulations on this fabulous book. Oh, thanks, Bethan. That was a real joy pulling that together last year. That's Take This Book for a Walk. Yeah. I love it because it's more like an invitation to play. Like it's it's a it's just got so many ideas and here you go, just write right in the book. You don't need extra stuff, you don't need to fuss, you just take it and go. Yeah, yeah. Well that was the whole idea and and that, that book's got a bit of an interesting story. The first book, Make a Date with Nature, was really me trying to get down some Uh, class notes really when I started doing workshops because in 2016 that's when I started doing the nature journaling workshops and I kind of invented it in my head because in those days when you googled nature journaling you didn't get a lot you know not many people or at least not many people that I could find were doing it even though I knew it wasn't a new idea but um, at the time I thought well look I'll combine the writing drawing and science and I've always loved teaching, so I thought, let's do this. And it it just seemed to take off, which was great. But I've always been surprised. Just Sorry, I will talk about the Take This Book for a Walk. No, Going back to Make a Date with Nature. I've always been surprised with that little book because it's a tiny little book. It was really written. I wrote it in maybe a day or so, and and I just use a lot of my pre-existing little drawings to put in it. And I've always offered it as a free e-book on my website, but... People just keep buying the print copies, which I find really heartening because um, obviously people still like print books and there's something about yes. that little book that is very appealing to people. And, and what's re- also really touching is because it's available as a free ebook, there are lots of people that access it and also teachers have access it. There was, there was a teacher working with um, um, First Nations youth way up in northwestern U.S., that uh, were using it was using it with their class. There's been other teachers in the US, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's really nice to connect with people and say, yeah, please use it. Please print it out if you want. There's been a lady working with Indigenous folks on the Gold Coast who's using it in that way as well. And yeah, so it's it's Fantastic. been a really nice um, experience for me that that little book. It's surprising sometimes what really resonates with people. Um, and then I I was wanting to do a draw and write in the book sort of nature journaling book which is what take this book for a walk ended up being and um, 
that came about because last year when everything went down to lockdown, a lot of my, uh, like everyone, a lot of my workshops and, and face-to-face activities were cancelled. But um, a, a lady called Kelly Pfeiffer got in touch with me and she's a teacher and she works in distance education. And perhaps for those uh, international listeners, I'll just explain in Australia, we have a huge country. There's a lot of people that live a long way away from towns, maybe on um, farms. And, um, and there's also people that travel that uh, use this thing called distance education. So the, the kids sort of, um, I guess they all contact um, through Zoom and other things these days, but it used to be much more over the radio and, and that sort of thing. But it's, it's still um, a, an active thing in Australia. And, and Kelly's based in Dubbo, which is sort of Western New South Wales. And she was um, wanting a book like that for her year seven class. So she saw, she had a copy of Make a Date with Nature, sorry, had a copy of my first book, um, Make a Date with Nature. And she, she contacted me and said, do you reckon you could just sort of publish another version with pages in between that the students could use? And I said, ah, oh, I've got something better because I'm working on this other thing that's, that is a, an interactive book that draws a lot from Make a Date with Nature but adds a lot more. And she said, oh, that'd be great. Can you do it? But I can't remember what the deadline was, but the deadline was about eight weeks away from when we were talking. And I was like, oh, um, yeah. Oh, wow. and, I, and I do like a challenge sometimes, um, often. <laughs> and because I didn't have any other work, I thought, okay, let's try and do this. And so the first thing I did was I rang the people that I, that do that print all my books in Melbourne, that's Minuteman Press in Paran, and I said, can we do this? You know, can can you get something printed at, in this time? And, and they gave me a deadline, and so we worked to that, and it got done, which was fantastic. And wow. The other really nice thing about it was that, Kelly had a captive audience. Well, she had a planned audience for the book and so she used it with her Year 7 class and she had me um, zooming in a couple of times during the semester as the sort of just the external person to talk to these kids and it was really nice feedback for me because the kids were saying stuff like, oh, I love this book because I'm doing school but I can do it when I'm outside and, and I love this book because... I get anxious sometimes but when I go outside and, and use this book, I don't feel as anxious. I feel happy or I can spend time with my horse oh. or, or all these sort of kids, do, you know, coming out with these really lovely responses and then seeing what they'd uh, written and drawn in the book is always really fabulous. So, so yeah, so and at the same time, of course, I've publicised it so anyone can go to my website and buy the book and, and had a, a really good response to it so so yeah and yeah so so it's always satisfying to put something out in the world that people seem to respond to in that way and at the time I hadn't seen another book that does that yeah that does the sort of you can just draw and write in this book they're probably about but at least in the Australian context we didn't have one we didn't have one with Australian uh, examples of plants and animals mm. Yes, I love that you are working from an Australian context. There's a lot of resources, um, North, uh, especially North American focused, and I love that you're focused on place and focused on the Australian context. And yeah, there's an exercise in your book um, called Reflecting on Place, and it encourages us to consider not only the place as it is today, but also back in history, 100 years, 200 years, 10,000 years, 5 million years, and what has happened in the changes uh, through the years in this one particular place. And I'd love for you to talk about that, of like rooting our reflections, our nature journaling in place and reflecting on the history of place. What's the benefits of that in your view? Mm, yeah, yeah. Um... That arose from a practice that I have in my workshops where whenever I get a bunch of people together in a place um, to do nature journaling, um, I always start with this. I, I start with let's think about place, let's think about you know the people that own this land now, the people that first settled here in Australia, usually that's sort of the first Europeans came here about 200 years ago, let's think about what they encountered and how they changed the land. And then, of course, the next step is 
um, thinking about the, the first Australians, the Indigenous Australians. And, and these days, I think there's um, data around that indicates the first Australians were here about 100,000 years ago. And, mm. and that reflection in itself really spins me out because it's hard to imagine um, being uh, occupying a place for that long and it's the the longest continuous human occupation of a place that we know of um, on the earth, I, th mm. I think. Um, so so I always like people reflecting on that. Um, and then, but then because I'm interested in plants and animals, I always go back further. And, and I have a secret weapon in this technique, Bethan, because my partner, the lovely Ray, is actually a paleobotanist. So, okay. so um, you know, <laughs> for about... The, nearly 30 years together I've been hearing stories about you know ancient um, plants more but also animals and ancient ecosystems and thinking about those things so that helps me to sort of get that information um, mm -hmm. but, but yeah and, and more as as we find out more and more about the Australian fossil record but also doing DNA analyses of plants and animals we, we get these amazing figures of how old some of these um plant and animal lineages are in our country. So, um, yeah, things like um, Araucaria, the hoop pines and the bunya pines going back over 100 million years, you can you can see fossils that don't look too dissimilar to what we have today, and that spins me out. Um, but also some of the, the birds in particular, there's some good information on birds, and it's quite uh, readily available in the most recent bird field guide. There's a good... Um, dated what they call a phylogenetic tree which shows you how old some of those bird lineages are and it freaks me out that things like um, cockatoos go back about 50 million years so yeah and and you can go on further and further but these are, I'm talking about these because these are the examples that appear and take this book for a walk but why is it important well look I think I think that the whole time thing is important because it, I think anything that makes us feel a bit small and insignificant can help us uh, realise that our problems today and our, our little ups and our little daily ups and downs are probably pretty small in the grand scheme of things. Yes, at least that's <laughs> what it helps me in that way. But the other thing is just to understand the richness of this place we're living here in Australia, you know, and and the riches and complexity of our ecosystems and these plants and animals that have been interacting together millions of years before humans even evolved, you know, and then we just sort of pop up. Yeah. I think humans pop up maybe five million years ago. Yeah, so I think it's, I just find it incredibly fascinating and um, and also just putting our own little problems into perspective. And and the talking about Indigenous Australians I think is really important and I think in Australia at the moment maybe people are more open to that than at any other time of, in my lifetime at least. So, so I think it's, it's also a very good time to bring it into the conversation. Um, and, and sometimes I'm fortunate enough to have people with an Indigenous um, heritage in my workshops and then they can add to that, which is of great benefit to the whole group. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different reasons to talk about place and, and bring those elements in. Another thing I use... In the Queensland context is I use our uh, native vegetation mapping, which in Queensland is very good and it's very readily available. And what that can show you is even though today I might give a workshop in a, in a park next to a sports ground that's mostly cleared, I can show people a map of what forest type or what vegetation type used to be there prior to European settlement. And that's also very useful in terms of... Um, well, to, to understand how much has been lost and what's been preserved, but also people want to revegetate and they want to grow native things in their garden or help out with bush care in the local park. They can know where to go to get the information of what used to be there. And in Australia, that's actually not so long ago. Usually, it's usually less than 200 years ago. Hmm. Yeah, oh, so, so fantastic. Sometimes I ask my guests to describe their place, uh, what they see when they go outside. And I know you're living in a very beautiful part of the world and I'd love to hear you talk a little about nature outside your door. Oh, look, I'm so fortunate at the moment because after I had my epiphany or, or after I made the big leap of leaving my real job in the big city um, for a couple of years, Ray and I lived in the suburbs of Brisbane 
in a beautiful place called Sandgate, uh, which for a suburb in Brisbane is a really lovely suburb because it's on the bay and it's got a lot of um, remnant bush around. And that's where the, the name Paperbark Writer came from because I was surrounded by paperbark swamps and woodlands in Sandgate. So Paperbark Writer is the name of my website. Um, but then we sort of looked at each other and said, well, we don't have a reason to be in the Brisbane suburbs anymore um, because my mother had passed away. She was living in the Sunshine Coast. I didn't have to go to the city for my job. Ray's always worked from home. And so, um, yeah, so we thought, where should we go? And there was one place that we'd been visiting for all our lives. We'd gone to this wonderful place and it's in the border. It's on the border between um, Queensland and New South Wales, near the coast. And uh, there's a huge national park there called Lamington National Park. And I went there when I was 14 and it blew my little mind. And I've been going back ever since. So, <laughs> so we live in a place um, near Lamington National Park. And Lamington National Park is part of the Gondwana Rainforest World Heritage Area. So it contains quite a lot of um, different types of subtropical um, and uh, cool temperate rainforests that you'll find in Australia, but also lots of eucalypt forests and other things. Um, the mountains are about uh, six to 700 uh, metres, so they're not huge mountains, but in Australia that's still a mountain. And um, so <laughs> where we live is right up near the National Park, so we get lots of wildlife, um, lots of birds. It's a really great um, climate for growing things. We're on volcanic soil, so it's good soil for growing all sorts of stuff. Um, so we're fortunate to have lots of native trees where we live, but we also have a pretty um, productive veggie garden. And uh, it's just really lovely to be in a place with wildlife and forests all around. And I feel very fortunate because um, just the way where my life has gone, I'm able to do that because I do mostly work from home. Yeah, so it's been a long term time coming, mm. but it's a great place to be but look if, if you want to go to the shops every day it's not a great place because it's still reasonably <laughs> far from civilization you know it's about a 35 minute drive um from shops and post offices and that sort of thing um but that suits us just fine <laughs> and fairly recently your local nature experienced some big changes due to fire ah oh, yes yeah. so yeah, well, it was an interesting time because the reason that Ray and I, one of the reasons we picked to live up in the bush um, near Lamington National Park was both of us were aware of the threats of climate change and the way um, the climate was changing but and how that would impact on fire in Australia. But of all the places to live in Australia, we thought this is probably pretty safe because it's a pretty wet place. Um, a lot yeah. of... Uh, the places where people want to live in the bush in Australia, which is generally around the coast, is very fire prone. But um, in in Queensland, it hasn't been so much that way um, in under the normal climate conditions because um, we tend to get our hottest time of the year is also our wettest time of the year, and there's a little window of opportunity at the end of um, end of winter, early spring, where the climate dries out a little bit. And you get some dry days, and that's our fire danger uh, period, at least in southeast Queensland. Um, but it's a very short window, and usually the fires aren't very intense. And I think part of that is due to the really high humidities we usually have in Queensland. Anyway, so Ray and I moved to to the mountains in the Gold Coast hinterland where we are now, and two years later we get probably one of the driest yeah. years on record, and um, come. Um, uh, August, September, the, our southern Queensland in general, that south east, east part of Queensland is experiencing really high temperatures, really low humidities. And then um, I think the fire itself, which started to the northwest of us, was started by someone dropping a cigarette butt by accident. Oh. And so that ignited and um, we just had a run of really horrible fire danger days. Once again, you know, high temperatures, high wind, low humidities, which were unprecedented in in um, recorded history in southeast Queensland. And that ended up with the fire coming to the uh, Beachmont Plateau. Now, we were fine where our house didn't get burned down. We had to evacuate for four days and didn't know whether we had a house to go back to. 
Um, other people weren't so lucky. I think there was 11 houses in the end that um, were destroyed and Binnaburra Lodge, which is the eco lodge down the road, was burnt down. So, yeah, it was... Yeah, it was a pretty stressful time, but I think I think for us, we saw it coming, and because we had, when I was working in for national parks in South Australia, I was part of the rural um, fire volunteer fire brigade, and so I had all the fire training, and I'd sort of experienced some mm. a, a particularly nasty fire down there on Lower Eyre Peninsula where nine people died, and um, while I was working for national parks. And so at least we were aware of what was coming. We saw what was coming and we were prepared to the degree of having the pet carriers ready for the chickens and <laughs> and all that sort wow. of thing. So, so you know, um, yeah, we, we, we find we came out of that fairly unscathed. Um, yeah. Um, but, you know, what the future holds, we don't know. And, and I think mm. anyone who lives um, in Australian bushland really needs to have some sort of a fire plan so they they're prepared yes. if that if that does happen because it's going to happen um scientists are predicting it's going to happen more and more because those fire danger days are becoming more and more and and even though we can do say prescribed burning and do control burning to a point it's we can't do it enough to protect everything it's um when you get an extreme fire day you really just have to get out of the way and go to a safe place. So I really hope people are getting that message. And and it's also the case, if even if you're living in suburbs um, that have some bushland or some trees nearby, you still are probably going to be facing this fire threat at some stage, um, given what's happening with the climate. Yeah. But look, it doesn't diminish our joy in this place. And, and this summer we've had... And what we feel is an extremely wet summer, but it turns out to be an almost average summer in terms of rainfall. And it's really <laughs> delightful seeing how green and lush everything is now. And um, certainly no threat of uh, rain. Uh, sorry, no, no threat of fire um, uh, last um, spring. Yeah. Mm. Oh, your, your part of the world sounds absolutely magical. And I'm glad... I, I've spent I've spent time in Binnaburra and um, yeah, it is a magical place. So it's really nice to hear you speak about it for people who haven't experienced it. So there are several really well known nature journal prompts uh, in the nature journal community, and they were created by John, John Muir Laws. And they are I notice, I wonder, and it reminds me of. And in your work, you add an extra one to this list and you say, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, and it makes me feel. And I just love this extra prompt. And I'd love for you to talk about that, about the prompt, it makes me feel. Yeah, well, it's interesting. When I wrote my little book, um, Make a Date with Nature, I actually wasn't even aware of what um, um, John Muir Laws was doing on the other side of the world. And I, and I think both of us at that time were really ramping up um, you know, what we were doing. But I did stumble across that wonderful um, nature journaling curriculum that's put out by, I think it's the California Native Plant Society, and, and that was really helpful for me to start formulating my ideas. I can't remember when I came across that, but I think that's when I first saw those prompts. Um, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, which are just such fantastic prompts. Um, yes. And so... Even though they didn't appear in my first book, I did start using them in nature journaling workshops. And what came, the, the it makes me feel I'm not sure where that came from, apart from the fact that it's something that is such an important part of nature for me. And, yes. and maybe it came about because I'd had this many years of, of being trained as a scientist um, and then working as a scientist in wildlife conservation. And when you're trained as a scientist, you're trained to be very objective and you're trained not to put any emotion at all in your writing and all that sort of stuff. And there's good reasons for that. But I think when I decided to, um, uh, to my career path took a, 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 a change, I really wanted to explore all that um, artistic, aesthetic, emotional stuff. It was like, 
you know, let's get into this now because for years I've been yeah. suppressing it. <laughs> um, and so that's probably what that um, it makes me feel thing came from. Um, and, I, and I always find it fascinating. Uh, yeah, and the other thing about that is I find uh, if we look at the news and we look at environmental reporting, maybe not so much now, but at least still a few years ago, a lot of it's still very factual, it's very objective, it's very the world's going to end and these are all our problems and all that sort of stuff, which is, you know, that's very important to report on. But I really like highlighting people's personal response to nature mm. and highlighting that emotional response because I think that's powerful. I think if people talk about why it's important to them in that way, that resonates with other people. So, yeah, yes. so I like throwing it in there. It's really funny when I'm teaching it, Usually you run through, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, and people are in a certain mode. They're sort of in a didactic question-answer mode. I, I, yeah, I don't know how else to explain it. it. It can be still quite objective and analytical. But as, as soon as you say, how does it make you feel? It's like people just stop and they shift gear. And for some people it's quite difficult, and I realise that. Some people find it very difficult to talk about emotional stuff, and I certainly never force anybody to you know, make any sort of response in a workshop that they're not prepared to do. But, um, yeah, it, it is um, usually um, there'll be people in the workshop that are more than happy to talk about it and it's great to hear their responses because you have everything. Usually when you're next to a tree, it's like, oh, it makes me feel small, you know, <laughs> which is a, an obvious yeah. one but a good one. And um, often it, it um, people's responses are usually generous and warm and all that sort of stuff. But I have had in my workshop once a woman say, well, it makes me feel very angry because in my house this is a weed, you know. So that's that's Ooh, always um, yeah. that's cool too, yeah. you know, and, and, and that's all part of um, a diversity of responses. Yeah. But but I'd yeah. encourage people to have experiment with it. It makes me feel and see where it takes you. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I think it's really wonderful to not only use the Nature Journal for exploring the outside world, but for the inside world mm. as well. And yeah. um, John Muir-Laws and Emily Ligren in their new book, How to Teach Nature Journaling, they actually use, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of inside themselves. So in ah, terms of like, yep. how do you feel? That's what do you cool. notice about your feelings? Yeah, I love yep. that, turning it around, turning it inward. Mm. Sometimes I ask my guests about... Um, is nature journaling a head activity or a heart activity? And I'm wondering about that for you. Maybe it's a mixture because you have you have the scientist in you and you have the artist as well. Is it a head activity or a heart activity for you? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, it's an it's a whole of body activity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely head <laughs> and heart. And and uh, I guess that's what I find so um, satisfying about my my current occupation, if you like, or my current life is that mm. I've finally been able to combine all of that together because because when I was taught to be a researcher, it had to be all objective and analytical. And then when I was a public service servant working for the government, it had to be all about making the um, Minister for the Environment look good, which was even more limiting. <laughs> um, and so having a situation where, or, or having a, a, a practice like Nature Journaling where you can take it in all sorts of directions and respond to it yeah. in different ways, and it changes from day to day too, you know. Yes. There'll be some, some days when... Um, like I keep a journal, which is a written journal, which is more of a personal journal, which no one else reads. And, and, and you know, there'll be days when I really need to write in that. But then there might be lots of days where it is much more looking at the aesthetics of things or, or asking questions about things um, out, in, out in nature. Yeah, finding out. At the moment I'm working on, I've been thinking a lot more about eucalyptus, which is one of the most common trees we have in Australia and just really trying to dig down into other activities for that, um, those types of trees. And that's been fascinating because there's a lot of analytical thinking that's going on with that mm. and, and mm. that's really satisfying too, particularly when in these days we're so connected you can ask experts and get opinions and 
and all that sort of stuff. So, so yeah, Beth, and it's a it's a whole of everything um, experience. And when I say an all the body experience, well, I, I'm very um, I really want to encourage myself and others to get outside and do it. And even though that can be uncomfortable or difficult sometimes, um, then you do have a whole of body experience of being out in nature with the good and the bad, with the getting wet and the cold and yes. mosquito bitten, but also mosquitoes. Yeah. <laughs> you know that that sort of movement of the air on your face and and different terrain mm. that you walk over and being in a certain place and all that sort of stuff, which is good for our, our whole of body. So. So, yeah, I'd encourage people yes. to do nature journaling in a, in a whole of body way if they can possibly have the opportunity <laughs> to do that. Mm. Yeah, I'm interested to talk about that field sketching because I, I'm i wondering about your process. Uh, I know that you aren't fussy with a pencil, you don't do a pre-sketch, you just go in with a pen and um, I'd love to talk about that, how people can go out with a, a pen and a piece of paper and not be fussing about mm. the art of it or making a p pretty picture, as Jack would say. Yeah, and I think that's really important. And, look, it's taken me over 40 years to be able to do that. So it's not – when you start drawing – or when I started drawing, there was that real desire to make things very realistic. Um, and that's very satisfying to be able to create a photorealistic – image of something in, in, in black and white or colour. And, and yeah, I do do drawing direct with an ink pen these days, but I'm, I'm, I might say too that I, I do do commission work where I do have to mm -hmm. um, create images that are much more realistic. Um, and for those, I do do a pencil sketch beforehand and then either do it with ink yeah. or colour in some way or something like that. So I, so I still use that technique. But the way I describe that is that's very goal driven. So if somebody at the moment I'm working on a colouring book about a certain type of wetland and, and my people who are employing me are saying, uh, we want it to be this scene, we want these species in it doing this. And so it's goal driven. You know what's going to, um, you know what it needs to be in the end. And so, but what I like to do with nature journaling is I like it to be much more process driven. And by that I mean it's more about the experience of being out in nature and responding in a non-pressured sort of way. So, and that's why I always try and emphasise with people, look, your nature journal is for you. It's not to hang on a gallery wall. It's not to actually yeah. be something in the end. Um, at least that's how I teach it. And the reason I try and teach it that way is because when you're more focused on if you let it, if you let go of your desire for your page to look like a certain way or your picture to be perfect or look a certain way, then you end up focusing more on the nature and more on the here and now yes. and more on your personal response. It's a bit hard to describe if you haven't experienced it, I think. But for me, I use nature journaling as a way to enhance the senses and to record my response in a more sort of organic sort of way I, I suppose and and I really encourage people to try and experience that process even if they don't do that sort of nature journaling all the time it's a really good mm. thing to experience and one of the really good exercises to sort of uh, let you into that world is that contour drawing exercise which is when you or some people call it blind contour drawing which is when you you just look at the thing you're trying to draw and you don't look at the page and so in that process, you're really being absorbed by the tree or whatever it is you're drawing and you're trying to let go of what it looks like. And some people find that incredibly hard and I understand that because it is. Um, but, but what that's trying to do is capture that moment in nature with you looking at that tree, nothing in between, <laughs> and, and just yes. um, trying to get that connection, I suppose. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so so at the moment what I tend to do when I'm nature journaling is I'll have a small um, uh, watercolour or mixed media sketchbook, I'll have an ink pen with um, uh, waterproof ink and I'll go out and I will just um, draw freely with the ink pen. And because I started doing that a few years ago, it's amazing how quickly your drawing ability improves but also your acceptance of your mistakes also improves because you can't rub yes. it out, you know, and, and you see urban sketches doing this all the time and, and I think it's a really good technique 
So I'd really encourage people to have a go at that, even if you just have that journal for that sort of drawing and then have a different journal for a different sort of drawing. Just just try different techniques. But I found that going out and drawing with the ink pen really freeing and then you can either um, add more darks and, and, and keep it as an ink drawing or you can add watercolour pencil or watercolour paints to it later. It's up to you. Um, yeah, and, and you're not so stressing out about what the um end product is yeah yes that's so important i think to to take away the art fear mm. because you're right it do, it does stand in between you and nature yeah it does and and but i really appreciate why it's there and how it can be there because i've been through that sort of period myself um, mm. and, and a lot of the work I do in workshops is encouraging people that they can draw, anyone can draw, you know, if, if you can write your name, you can draw as um, the wonderful right side of the brain uh, person <laughs> reminds us. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so really, but that's not to say, look, if you're starting out and you still enjoy that challenge of, of doing a, yes. a, a drawing that looks exactly like the thing, go for it, you know, because that is a really yes, of good... Course technique it's a really good skill and it's really satisfying to reach that level of proficiency um, with your drawing mm -hmm. but but I'd encourage people to uh, consider that that's not all the sort of drawing you can do because as I always say to people yes um, drawing something in a way that looks like a photo is one way to draw but there's all these other ways to draw and so don't limit yourself to that you know try and explore other things and 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 you'll probably end up finding different techniques and approaches are really satisfying as well in a different way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What do you think about the link between nature journaling and conservation or stewardship? How are they linked in your mind? Oh, look, I hope they're linked. I guess after all those years working in wildlife conservation, I, I, I came to the conclusion that, you know, the, the biggest threat to our, our, our environment is human behaviour and that's the one that's mm. hardest to change. And I got there by seeing how conservation was done on the ground. And, um, yeah, I could talk a lot about that, but I won't. Um, so, <laughs> and, the, and the thing that also really frustrated me in Queensland is we went through a period where a different government came in and cut all our education and extension programs for the Environment Department. And that was really crushing. Yeah, so all these things got me very... Um, agitated about how are people going to care about the environment if they don't know about it, they're not connected to it, um, even in the most basic way. And and that was a big impetus for what I do now. So, so I think um, allowing people or encouraging people or giving people the opportunity to make a personal connection to nature is perhaps one of the things that will save our natural world because if you have that personal connection, you're more likely to care about it. And the reason I'm quite comfortable talking about emotions and feelings and all that sort of thing is that I believe that more people, more people are, are, are sort of motivated by emotions and feelings and personal connections than the number of people that are motivated by facts. Now, a lot of scientists yes. that I know, a lot of my friends get really excited about facts, but I understand now <laughs> that they're probably in the minority of the population. So <laughs> I'm very comfortable with um, working with a whole range of people and trying to encourage them to connect with nature in whatever way. And I suppose that's why I always say nature journaling can be a, a head or heart activity or a whole body experience yes. or whatever because it depends on the person and how they're more likely to get turned on by nature, I suppose. And I would want to um, just say to people it's just the one thing. It can be so many different things. So, so yeah, so I suppose what I'm trying to do in Nature Journey, the whole reason I got into it and I teach it is to try and get people out there and responding to nature in their own personal way and getting that connection and then hopefully they might care about it a bit more and might change their behaviour um, to try and do things that will help conserve our natural world. Mm. Paula, it's been such a joy to chat with you. I love the way your work bridges science and the heart. It combines so many different things and it's been a wonderful chat. Thank you so much for being here. 
Oh, thank you, Beth. And then look, I, I, I also want to say how much I appreciate the work you're doing with Nature Journaling and all the effort you're putting into promoting it and uh, creating this podcast and um, contributing to, you know, the Facebook Nature Journaling groups and doing International Nature Journaling Week. I mean, I think it's just <laughs> so exciting. It was particularly exciting last year when COVID hit for you to draw so many people together with your International Nature Journey Week and really highlight how many people out there are doing this. And it's it's kind yes. of spooky, isn't it? Because it's like a bit of a, a zeitgeist that, um, you know, I know with myself, when I started, I didn't think many people were doing it, but I thought, hey, this is good stuff. And obviously there's a lot of people around the world and and um, who've thought the same thing. You know, I, I, I know there was... Um, people out there who had books. I, I remember the, one of the books that inspired me were Claire Walker-Leslie's books that I got hold yes. of in the local library. So I'm, I'm not diminishing that there have been people out there doing this, but at the moment it seems like there's a lot of people, a lot of interest. So let's hope that continues, hey, because it is such a wonderful thing to do. Yeah, I think it's just really, I've noticed since COVID that it's just becoming more and more. And I think that's because people need we need nature, we need connection mm. with ourselves and each other, and this is the perfect way to do it. So I think that's the reason why it's growing so quickly. Mm. So thank you for being here. It's been such a nice chat. Thanks for having me, Bethan. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Paula. She has a very relaxed and welcoming way about her and is constantly supporting others in their nature journal efforts. Paula started a Facebook group called Nature Journaling Australia, where she has facilitated the coming together of nature journalers from all across Australia. I'll leave links to Paula's website and social media accounts in the show notes for this episode. I'd like to say thank you to you, the listener, for being here and supporting this podcast. Sometimes I receive messages of support and encouragement and this helps me know that you're there and that you're getting something out of the podcast. Please remember that you can drop me an email anytime if you have ideas and suggestions about people you'd like to hear interviewed or topics you'd like me to cover in a solo show. Thank you especially to those who've joined me on Patreon. Your support means so much and I want you to know that. I have a monthly newsletter that you can subscribe to to receive news and updates as well as what I call the Nature Journaling Inspiration List. This is a list of five inspiring things that are happening around the globe in nature journaling each month. If you'd like to receive this newsletter, use the link in the show notes to sign up. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. Mm-hmm.